Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming down. I know this is the last slot uh, of the first day. That's always a tough one to stay awake in and participate in. So thank you for, thank you for making it down and also for finding these rooms. Um, so my name is Andrew. Uh, I work at a company called Cytale. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Cytale today, but I am going to talk a lot about uh, the project that we've been helping, uh, helping steward uh, called Spiffy. Um, and out of interest, uh, just a quick show of hands, who had actually heard of Spiffy before today? Okay, cool, about half. Um, excellent, so that means, um, that, that means uh, at least half of you are very excited. Um, <clears throat> So uh, uh, I'm going to jump in and, uh, and give you a little bit of an overview of what Spiffy is and, and, uh, and also Spire, the, the actual, which is the actual implementation of Spiffy. Uh, you, we, uh, we also have another session on tomorrow, uh, the Spiffy Deep Dive, where we're going to take some of the ideas that we talk about um, at a very hand-wavy, conceptual, graphical level um, and dive into the meat of how they actually work. Um, and so my colleague Emiliano, um, along with uh, a couple of... Um, uh, friends of ours from VMware are going to run that. Uh, so I'd encourage folks who find this interesting and want to get to the meat of it. Uh, if we don't get to your questions later, um, please, do, uh, uh, please do get involved there as well. There's a few other events as well, a few panels and things like that. And then, of course, we're all on Slack and, and GitHub. So uh, to jump into Spiffy. Uh, so Spiffy is uh, fundamentally solving for the problem of trust between workloads. And by workloads, we just really is a, is a general term we use for any software system. You might also use the word service, which is also kind of an overloaded term. Um, but fundamentally, we're trying to solve for trust. And by, that, by trust, what I mean is that if I'm a source workload trying to talk to a destination workload, to use some networking nomenclature, um, as a destination workload, can I trust that something else talking to me is in fact who it says it is, and that the messages that it's sending me were actually from that, uh, that original source? Now, trust is not a new problem, by the way. If you've ever used a password or a shared secret or a shared token of some kind, uh, then you've participated in establishing trust. Uh, what is a new problem, though, or is becoming increasingly a more acute problem, uh, is, is really twofold. One of them is just simply the number of workloads that need to establish trust between each other in order to deliver some kind of, let's call it customer experience. Um, and this is kind of a contrived piece of architecture, but you get the idea. Um, when people start throwing around words like microservices uh, and or um, service-oriented architecture, what that means in practice is that you have uh, a number of discrete, independent running processes that are connected over a network that need to be able to trust each other. Um, the number of these things is growing. As an industry, we're starting to build more and more and build more maturity and practice and tooling around taking uh, monolithic applications that just shared memory and breaking them out into these different components. So we have more things that need to trust each other, for one thing. The other thing that's uh, something of an emerging trend over the last maybe five years or so um, has been the heterogeneity that we're starting to deploy these systems into. Uh, no longer are they just running in a data center somewhere um, where the hardware has been specced and fitted out by a single team. Now maybe some of my solutions running in uh, one cloud provider, some of my solution is still running on premise, maybe some other part of my solution is running on another cloud provider. Um, when I used to work at Google, uh, as a product manager at Google, I saw more and more, or I, I saw this becoming an increasing problem rather than a decreasing problem. Uh, the heterogeneity of infrastructure uh, is um, becoming a real challenge. The other dimension of heterogeneity that's often a challenge is uh, the, the middleware layer, the number of different systems I can use to manage these running workloads. Uh, now, that might be a, you know, a container scheduler like Kubernetes. It might be a pass system built on top of a container scheduler. It might be something independent like, say, Cloud Foundry. Um, it may be JBoss or WebSphere or something you've rolled yourself. But again, you have this uh, rich diversity of uh, different ways you can run systems. And when, most, uh, when you build a project in isolation, maybe you'll just pick one of these for the case of simplicity. But when you have legacy, uh, and when you have, for that matter, just different teams operating independently, they may all make different technology choices. Even if you standardize on something like, say, Kubernetes, you may well have, and may well even desire, to have multiple Kubernetes clusters, either for availability or for isolation or for some other reason. So either way, we also have heterogeneity at the middleware layer. Um, and then, of course, People pick and choose their own stacks for actually doing auth n and auth z and so forth. Uh, and then finally, we have third-party APIs. Um, you know, as we uh, as, as we start to see these uh, rich services that provide um, uh, third-party infrastructure, things like you know whether that's 
uh, something as, as, as transactional as sending an email or something more robust like, say, um, <clears throat> Uh, invoice management, uh, we start to farm out a lot of our workloads to third-party systems where we have no idea what the infrastructure is that they're running on. Um, so this is kind of the world, this is just really just to set the stage of the world that Spiffy uh, is entering into and operating into. Before we get to Spiffy, uh, worth recapping a couple of strategies that are used today to solve for this. Uh, the first is what, what I might consider kind of classical trust management or classical, for that matter, authentication. And I've kind of crudely generalized here more or less every shared secret form of authentication that you can manage, but it basically works the same way. You have uh, a destination workload has some concept of identities for the, for the source workloads that want to connect to it. It might be a registry of accounts. Um, a concrete example might be I'm running a MySQL database and I have MySQL usernames and passwords that are stored in a table in that database. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I, uh, I send that, I, I then uh, create an account to represent my source workload. I take that credential, I give it to the source workload. The source workload then uses that to authenticate as part of a handshake. So that hopefully looks in abstract fairly familiar to you in some form. Um, there's a couple of problems with this model though. Uh, for one, uh, we need to f we need it's, it doesn't lead itself well to being automatable. We need to create these accounts for one thing, and the way you create these accounts is different for every different system because it has a different auth and C model. Uh, you then need to distribute these secrets uh, or the, the, the token for these secrets and the identity metadata over to the source workload so that it can actually uh, authenticate. Um, and then uh, you need to and, and we need to figure out a distribution system that's robust. Uh, we also need to figure out how to rotate these things, uh, you know, to, uh, to constantly manage them. Um, and there are a number of uh, secret stores and other products that do a great job of uh, maintaining secret credentials um, on your behalf, and they can dynamically, in some cases, dynamically create accounts and dynamically rotate them for you. Uh, but even with secret stores, you have a problem, which is the uh, secure introduction problem or the trust bootstrapping problem, which is how does your workload actually connect to the secret store in the first place to authenticate itself? It's using a token. It has these same problems for the most part. Um, so this is one model for doing authentication. Um, the other model uh, is, is what we often see uh, when we have consistent platforms. Uh, so for example, you might see this in AWS. Uh, for example, you see this actually in Kubernetes. Uh, uh, and broadly, again, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but the way this model works is you have some kind of privileged API that uh, is able to reason out of band uh, who a workload is. And so the workload, rather than having credentials created in it, rather than having credentials defined in a destination workload and then copied to a source workload. Um, instead, this platform-mediated privileged API is able to say, well, we, we have some existing concept of who you are. If you're running an AWS, a, say an EC2 instance, for example, well, we know what security group you're in. We know what IAM roles you might have associated with you. Um, so we, we already know, we have some concept of identity for you already, and we can, we can allow you to, we know that you are the caller uh, requesting that identity so we can retrieve for you your specific identity and the documents that you might need to prove that. Uh, likewise, a remote API uh, is able to verify those documents or verify, key, uh, or, uh, you know, verify say, a nonce that's been encrypted uh, using those documents. So a, a destination workload is also able to, uh, to, to lean into this as well. Um, and this is a, a, a much more preferable model for several reasons. For one of it is it's API driven, so it's it's much more amenable to automation. Uh, another nice property of this API is that uh, every uh, identity is you have one identity per workload, effectively. So rather than the um, the, the former model where you might have, uh, I, whereas an, as a workload. I need multiple different identities for every other workload that I'm going to need to talk to. I need, uh, I need to identify myself to an API. I need to identify myself to a database. I need to identify myself to my queuing system. Uh, with this model, instead, I have one identity, which is me, uh, and then I can prove that identity, assert it to anyone else that I need to talk to. And then that other system can make a decision based on that identity as to whether or not it wants to actually allow a connection or allow me to perform some action. Um, so this is a really nice model, conceptually. It has one problem, though which is that it requires every workload to be running on that platform, or at least every source workload to be running on that platform. Uh, uh, so if you're running everything inside AWS, and you're running everything in a form that AWS can reason about, i.e. you're not running it on a Hadoop cluster, say, that you're running yourself, or a Kubernetes cluster you're running yourself, this model actually works really well, as long as you don't mind really locking yourself in to AWS to a certain extent. Uh, but, as soon as, but in the real world, we often see, again, 
uh, multiple different uh, environments that I want to be able to span trust across. And in this case, this model starts to break down. So enter, at a very crude level, uh, the goal that we're trying to solve for for Spiffy, which is to try and provide um, a version of this kind of platform-mediated identity without necessarily, requ necessarily requiring you to buy in to a, an entire homogenous platform. Um, and just to summarize, you know, this is kind of the, the, the sort of, you know, business school 101 chart on the, the, the strengths of, of Spiffy as a system. We're trying to have our cake and eat it too to a certain extent in terms of uh, uh, a reliable uh, primitive to build authentication on top of, uh, but that it does not require us to lock into a single platform. So when we talk about Spiffy, we actually talk about two projects. Uh, Spiffy itself uh, really refers now to a specification, and in particular, uh, a specification for this workload API. And I'm going to talk about some of the components for that in a second. Uh, the other project we talk about is Spire, the Spiffy runtime environment, uh, which is the software that actually implements that specification that allows you to use it uh, yourself. Um, uh, fairly early on in the project, we recognize the benefits of actually separating these as concerns, um, that there may be multiple providers that implement the Spiffy interface. Uh, it may even be cloud providers at some point start to implement this. Um, Spire is one implementation that you can use. And in fact, uh, 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 something that we won't get too much time to talk about today, but is a really interesting idea, is the ability to be able to federate across uh, uh, and bridge trust between multiple different uh, uh, Spiffy compliant installations. Um, but this, this is Spiffy and Spire is kind of the core of the project. So the Spiffy specifications uh, uh, cover in detail three things. The first is the format of an ID itself, which is really a string. Um, and an ID, you know, a string format sounds boring, but it's important. Uh, the, uh, the, the Spiffy ID, it's, it's a, you, you probably recognize this format broadly, it's a URI. Uh, and there's two really important parts of this URI. The first is what we call a trust domain. Um, a, a trust domain effectively uh, maps to the uh, the identity issuing infrastructure. So um, every Spire installation uh, corresponds to a trust domain. Um, trust domains uh, can be hierarchical, much as much as domain names can be. Um, and uh, if you've ever worked with PKI and you've worked with kind of name constraint delegated uh, um, uh, certificates, uh, you can do the same. You can uh, you can lean on similar properties with with Spiffy as well. The other piece in this is the workload identifier. So uh, once we have a trust domain. Uh, now I, uh, I need to identify specific workloads inside it. Um, and this is, you know, looks a lot like and behaves a lot like a file path. Uh, Spiffy itself just treats this as an opaque string. It doesn't really reason about um, hierarchy or anything like that, but you can, you can implement hierarchy if you want to, say, for, uh, for Ackling rules and policy. Um, so once you have this string, then we need a way of, uh, for a workload to be able to prove that it, in fact, has, well, to, to provide proof of possession, uh, to prove that it is entitled uh, and, and uh, uh, has claim on this particular Spiffy ID. Uh, and so for that, we use the, what we call the Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document. And this is actually a fairly generic idea. Um, uh, over time, we expect multiple different formats of, of uh, SVIDs. Uh, for now, though, the Spiffy ver there's, we, have a, we specify a particular flavor of the Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document, which from now on, I'm going to call SVID. Uh, a particular flavor of the SVID called the X509 SVID that's based on X509 certificates. And basically what we've done is taken the X509 spec and, and uh, worked out a, uh, a robust um, but meaningfully precise subset of that um, that's used to uh, encode spiffy IDs inside certificates and provide keys that can be uh, used to assert that. Um, and crucially, you know, we, uh, we, we expect these documents to typically be short-lived. Um, and it's feasible for us to do that in part because these things are API-driven. Um, there are other formats of SVID we're looking at, uh, such as you know, one based on JOT, for example, um, in cases where you want a document format that might survive uh, you know, layer 7. Um, but uh, uh, generally speaking, these are the documents that the API provides. Um, and then we have the workload API itself. Uh, the workload API uh, runs, uh, is available to every workload that needs it inside a Spiffy, uh, 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 a set of uh, Spiffy-enabled workloads, if you will. Um, the workload API is node local. Uh, it doesn't require any authentication, and this is actually crucial because the core problem we're solving for is trust bootstrapping. So if we required you to provide some kind of API key to authenticate to Spiffy, it would somewhat defeat the whole purpose. Uh, so this workload is node local. Uh, in practice, in Unix, it's exposed via a Unix domain socket. We're looking at other ways of exposing it as well. Uh, 
Um, and uh, a workload, when it wants to retrieve its identity, when it wakes up and wants to know who it is, uh, it doesn't need any a priori knowledge of who it is. It doesn't need to know if it's running in Kubernetes on Azure. It doesn't need to know if it's running on-prem in JBoss. It doesn't need to know if it's in staging or production or development. Uh, it, can, it, can, it can ask this of the system itself. Uh, so it does this by calling the workload API. Uh, the workload API, the infrastructure behind it, is then responsible for figuring out who this workload is. In the case of a cloud platform, it might already know who this workload is because it's already got uh, metadata from its control plane to figure that out. Um, in the case of Spire, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of how this works in a second. Um, but it makes a who am I call. Uh, the workload API uh, attests this workload, verifies who it is, and uh, once if it if it finds uh, a uh, if it if it can identify this workload, it will retrieve it will send it both back the spiffy ID and then also these short-lived documents that it can use uh, the keys it can use to prove that identity to other systems, um, and uh, uh, also a what we call a certificate bundle, a set of certificates uh, that allows it to verify the identities of any other running workload. Um, that's been suitably spiffy enabled as well. And these are just X509 certificates. So for the most part, if you have client libraries that are X509 compliant, and in particular compliant with the SVID spec, uh, then you can use them to do anything you like. So you can use them to establish a TLS connection. You can use them to sign uh, a JOT token. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the use cases we're seeing out of Sp uh, spiffy and Spire in a moment, but. I, I wanted a sec to talk about how Spire actually works because I think that's a, a useful exercise. Um, so Spire is composed of an agent and a server. The agent runs on every uh, node inside your infrastructure. Again, it's node local, and this is what exposes the workload API. The server uh, is effectively kind of a combination of uh, an, an API itself, um, a, uh, a registry of these identities, of your workload identities, and what we call the attestation policies that describe how those identities should be issued. Um, and then finally, uh, it's effectively a certificate authority as well, which can be seeded by intermediate keys. Um, the registry that it contains, uh, you know, contains uh, metadata that looks, I'm simplifying a little here, but it looks a little bit like this. Uh, you have firstly the ID that you want issued, and then you have a set of selectors that define the conditions uh, that a workload must match in order to be granted that identity. And there's a number of different, uh, Spire is extremely modular, so there's a number of different mechanisms you can use to describe a workload. Um, but typically, you would do it in, with, with at least two forms of selector, one at the uh, infrastructure level and then one at the uh, workload or middleware level. So the infrastructure level uh, might be, uh, in this case, we're saying uh, the billing payments uh, service of acme.com must be running in this particular security group within AWS. Uh, but you could use other mechanisms there as well. It might be a, uh, a particular network policy or a particular label. Um, inside other constructs, like say VMware, you might use other ways of describing the set of, of, of virtual machines, the set of nodes that uh, comprise the workload. Um, but that's often not enough, um, uh, you know, particularly when we're talking about Kubernetes and we may have a cluster with multiple different workloads running on it. It's important for us to be able to uh, distinguish beyond the node level uh, what, a, uh, uh, you know, what constitutes a, a workload. Um, and so therefore we need node, uh, workload level selectors. In this case, we have a very simple example, which is the workload must also have the Unix UID of 1001. Um, but you could, uh, you could lean on other metadata as well. I'll give an example later where we talk about this with Kubernetes and, and PodSpec metadata as selectors. Um, but basic, but the, the key point here is that Spire, the, the Spire server maintains a large registry of all of these different identities. Um, so now I'm going to uh, 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 work through a contrived example of how a workload, when it wakes up, actually retrieves an identity. So, uh, and in this case, we're going to assume uh, we're going to assume basically the the set that we talked about before: a workload running in a particular security group inside AWS, uh, and that is also running as a particular Unix process. Um, so, for those who aren't necessarily familiar with AWS or Unix, I'm going to ask you to squint a little bit with some of the detail here. Um, <clears throat> uh, but this is just a worked example. So, uh, uh, first of all, uh, we have a workload running on an EC2 instance. It's this billing service. Uh, the EC2 instance uh, is booted for the first time, uh, and running on this EC2 instance, as well as the workload, is this Spire agent running as a daemon. The Spire agent wakes up, and the first thing it needs to do is authenticate itself to the Spire server. The way it does this 
is by leaning on the, a, a trust primitive of AWS, which is the EC2 instance, uh, sorry, EC2 uh, uh, metadata API. Uh, and from that, it's able to retrieve a thing called the instance identity document, uh, which is effectively, which is a document that contains uh, a subset of the metadata about that instance, including its instance ID, and that's been signed by Amazon. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, EC, any process running on the EC2 instance can retrieve this without, again, any authentication, um, and they can provide it to the spy assert, and, and it can provide it to another process in order to assert that uh, this instance is in fact the instance it claims to be. Uh, so we use this in the handshake to the spy server. Uh, uh, we pass we pass this document. The spy server is then able to verify it with Amazon's public key. Um, it's then also able to look up back into Amazon and retrieve additional metadata about this workload. So um, I have an instance ID, but I want to know what network it's running in, what security group it's running in, what labels it has, what IAM roles it has, et cetera. Um, so Spire Server does this, and uh, it then goes through that directory of identities to retrieve the, and, and to figure out the subset of identities that are entitled to be run on that node. Again, we have a set of uh, node selectors in place, so it's basically saying, okay, now I have an EC2 instance, find me the list of nodes that match that ID, that, sorry, the, the list of uh, attestation policies that uh, match this instance, and it'll then uh, return, uh, it'll return a list of spiffy IDs as well as all of the selectors associated with those IDs back to the Spire agent. At this point, the workload doesn't know anything, by the way. So now the workload wakes up. Uh, the workload wants to know who it is, so it makes its who am I call to the local workload API, uh, which is provided by the Spire agent. Uh, the Spire agent needs to figure out who this workload is. Um, we expose this workload API as a Unix domain socket, which means that we can retrieve metadata from the kernel to figure out who this workload is. Uh, again, it assumes that we trust the kernel here. So. Uh, uh, so the Spire agent will, will do this out-of-band check. It'll pull down kernel metadata like UID and PID and so forth uh, and compare that to the list of attestation policies that it got from the Spire server. Um, in more interesting examples, say with Kubernetes, uh, the Spire agent can also then go and uh, look up against, say, the kubelet uh, to uh, cross-reference and say, hey, kubelet, is this, does this PID uh, uh, correspond to a workload that you scheduled on this node, and if so, can you tell us a bit about it, give it me a pod spec for it, and, and so forth. Um, so it collects all of this data about the workload, and then again it goes through its list of attestation policies and finds the list of identities, and hopefully there's only one, uh, that correspond to this workload. Um, uh, if it finds one, then uh, the first thing it'll do is it'll generate the key for that workload on that node, and this is actually a pretty important property of Spire. Um, the key material for this workload never should leave this node. So it generates a key and then sends a certificate signing request back to the Spire server saying, hey, I've got, a, uh, I've got an identity. Uh, I've got a, uh, um, I have an identity. I have a, uh, uh, I know that it's meant to be running on this node. Um, please, issue a, please issue certificates to every other identity so that they can prove, so that, that we can associate this key with that ID. So it sends a CSR to the Spire server. The Spire server makes sure that this, uh, yes, uh, we do expect this workload to exist on this machine, and it'll, um, and it'll issue uh, to both back to the original workload and to every other workload uh, the certificate that's necessary to verify it. Uh, and then finally, the workload API will wrap all of this up and deliver this material to the workload itself. Um, <clears throat> and so as I said, uh, this is basically the Spire uh, authentication uh, mechanism in a nutshell. Um, one thing that I, ha I in this case I've provided a contrived example, but one really important point about Spire is it's extremely modular. So it supports uh, a number of different uh, attestation mechanisms via a plugin model, um, and uh, through that a number of different selectors. So selectors may be in terms of infrastructure concepts, it might also be in terms of uh, Kubernetes concepts. Uh, you might also say, for example, that a particular doc, a, uh, uh, a, uh, the, the workload must also correspond to a particular Docker image or have been started from a particular Docker image with a particular content shard, for example. Um, so in terms of use cases for, for Spiffy and Spire, uh, you know, we're starting to see quite a few. Uh, a, very, a key one, actually, is secure introduction to secret stores, be they things like Vault, um, uh, uh, Pinterest uh, have started using this for uh, secure introduction to Knox. Um, because it solves quite nicely for the biggest problem with secret stores, which is the secure introduction problem. Um, 
Uh, some we're starting to see integration into some uh, low-level libraries that perform authentication. Uh, again, you know, by hooking directly into the workload API, uh, you can avoid a lot of the nastiness involved in generating PKI and delivering it to nodes and, uh, uh, and um, uh, the, the significant nuance involved if you want to automatically rotate those keys. Uh, a really interesting use case is uh, for proxies, uh, you know, having rather than necessarily building all of this into existing software systems, uh, use a, a proxy as an ambassador and have that proxy uh, uh, call into the workload API to retrieve the identity uh, of the workload and the key material to prove it and use that to establish um, trust between um, uh, uh, trust to another workload. Uh, another use case that um, uh, we haven't seen a ton of use of yet, but we think is a really compelling use case for Spire, is actually simplifying the, uh, uh, simplifying the bootstrapping of uh, existing distributed systems, things like Kubernetes, although Kubernetes now has a few projects to solve for this, projects like Hadoop, uh, projects like Chef and Puppet and so forth, uh, where uh, you also have these distributed systems where you have different nodes with different roles that need to be able to establish material to them. If you've ever, tried, if you've ever followed uh, Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, uh, you'll know you spend the first four or five months of following that tutorial setting up PKI. Um, so there's potentially a role for something like Spire to help, help with that uh, significantly. Um, we're trying to build, basically, though, uh, two communities uh, in this. Uh, one of them is the community of projects that are, are starting to adopt the Spiffy uh, Workload API um, to simplify authentication and to simplify trust establishment. Um, an equally important community is the community around Spire, both getting it in place, helping to build it out and making it more robust, and contributing components to it. Uh, again, Spire is, ver by design, extraordinarily modular. Um, which makes contributing at particular extension points for particular environments very easy. Um, uh, at the deep dive talk tomorrow, uh, I, the folks from VMware are going to talk about the Kerberos node tester that they built, for example, for folks who already have Kerberos to, to establish trust. Um, uh, uh, but there's also extension points for different, uh, uh, different um, orchestrators, different operating systems, uh, and for that matter, different backing CAs and secret stores as well as things like TPMs. So if this work is interesting to you, by the way, please do get in touch because we'd, uh, we'd, we'd love to see more here. And there's uh, now is a, an excellent time to start getting involved in the project where the bones of it are pretty well factored, but there's a, a lot of work to do uh, to grow it. Um, uh, another thing we're working on is a security audit that's due in the next uh, couple of months, I think. Is that right, Justin? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, ultimately, this is a security product, so having a good understanding of what the threat model is, uh, best practices for implementing and, uh, uh, and, and what Spiffy doesn't solve for as much as what it does solve for is, is, is particularly important. Um, and so uh, you know, we, we've wanted to make sure that we have uh, you know, good visibility um, and uh, 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 an, asserted, an asserted position from the community on uh, w where and how you should be able to trust Spiffy. And for that matter, to help us uh, understand our roadmap. So uh, we should be, I think in the next couple of months, we should be having some, some more public discussion about that. Um, it's, and actually, that's a good segue into what Spiffy isn't, because this is often misunderstood. Uh, Spiffy is about identity. Um, you could argue Spiffy is, to a certain extent, about authentication. What it is not is about authorization. Spiffy will tell you who you're talking to. Uh, it won't tell you if you should. Uh, that's authorization. Uh, and that's a policy decision that you can implement separately. The good news is there's a bunch of very interesting projects that are starting to tackle that uh, in a meaningful way. Um, there's plenty of different protocols for mediating authorization. There's several different proxies, as you know. And then there are a number of different policy engines that are starting to provide a, a, a way of, um, of, of taking the configuration for these things and rolling them up in a useful way. So there's a lot of good work happening there. We see Spiffy as very much a fundamental pillar upon which systems can be built. The other thing it's not, it's not transport level security. Uh, Spiffy will give you IDs, it'll give you documents to prove those IDs, but it doesn't actually mitigate a connection for you. It doesn't reason about the IP address that a remote workload is running on. Uh, it doesn't reason about how to negotiate a connection to that. Uh, that is left to the protocols themselves. Again, good news is there's plenty of prior art there um, that we can lean on already. Um, so you can use X509 certificates generated by Spiffy to, to establish a TLS connection. You can use them to sign a JWT token. Um, and uh, you know, we hope to see, again, uh, more and more projects uh, align around that. But fundamentally, Spiffy is about identity. Um, so finally, I, I wanted to close out um, on some of the things we didn't talk about uh, to whet your appetite a little bit. Um, you know, the, as I said, Spire is extremely modular. You can integrate into custom, as well as custom PKI infrastructure, also custom data stores. Um, uh, we haven't talked about that much yet. 
Um, there's a number of interesting design patents coming out. Uh, we had a talk earlier today about a design pattern whereby Spiffy can be used with uh, Vault, um, or for that matter, any you know, robust secret store, um, to be able to um, act as an identity translation layer for projects that aren't necessarily Spiffy aware yet, like a database, for example. Um, and provide uh, you know richer ackling policies. Uh, you know service mesh is obviously you know, I'm going to call it a design pattern here um, is a really interesting model whereby you have these ambassador proxies running everywhere. Um, an obvious integration point for Spiffy Inspire. And we hope to have more talks on that in the future. Um, uh, another piece that we'd, we'll we'll hopefully talk about later at some point is federation. Again, this ability to be able to take multiple uh, Spiffy compliant pieces of infrastructure and have them. Uh, peer with each other and uh, establish mutual trust even though the identity providers are logically distinct pieces of infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and we did talk about the security order this time. <laughs> um, but there'll be more details coming later. Um, so we'll take some questions in a second, but I'll close out on saying uh, we've got, uh, 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 as well as the deep dive tomorrow, uh, and as well as several panels going on throughout the week, uh, we, also have, uh, uh, we also have a great community online. So I'd encourage folks who are interested in this problem space um, uh, to jump on Slack, get involved in the community, uh, and of course find the code on GitHub and get involved there as well. Um, uh, and thank you. With that, I'll. <laughs> we uh, got any questions? So I didn't notice how you solve the problem of it working only if everything's on the same platform. Uh, so the the <clears throat> oh, so Spire can run on multiple platforms. Uh, you can you can have a workload running in AWS. You can have a workload running in uh, Google uh, Google Cloud, for example. Uh, they can both ha they both have identities issued to them by the same Spire server. Uh, so sp same Spire server. Yes, if you want to. Um, another model would be you have two Spire servers and you federate to them. Uh, but the, the idea behind it is that the, um, uh, uh, the Spire deployment itself can uh, span multiple different providers. It doesn't it's not necessarily limited to one. So it's, it's multiple infrastructure providers, but it's one Spire provider. Yes. Hopefully, at some point. That's, what that's, that's where federation comes into this. And that is, I won't, you know, uh, super interesting problem. That's where we want to be. Um, I wouldn't call it a solved problem at this point. Um. Yeah, certainly. So the question was, how does this apply to serverless? Um, and uh, we're still working through some design patterns there, to be honest. Um, one of them is you have very fat client libraries that do a lot of the work of the Spire agent, um, which is a model that works, but it's not a great model. Um, another one is that you have uh, you know, a, an ambassador proxy that you're able to establish trust from the uh, serverless component to. Um, uh, there's a project called Glue, I think, G-L-U-U, that's starting to do that. Um, uh, the other model, the ideal, uh, the long-term model is for uh, cloud providers to start baking these primitives in, so you can start using, uh, you can just retrieve the identity directly um, and then federate. Yeah, with PaaS, um, if, 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 if you don't have direct access to the infrastructure of the PaaS platform, then yeah, that's the, the model you end up looking at. Question? Um, I just want to make sure I understood correctly that the um, trust between the agent and the Spire servers is to established through Amazon certificates in the case you gave in, but is there another way to do that, or is that the only way? Because I, mean, I feel there, there, uh, there, there needs to be a trust between the, the agent and the server somehow. So how does that get bootstrapped in a case where you don't run Amazon? Or? That, that's exactly right. We, so the, the example we gave here was for a workload running on Amazon, but uh, it is, uh, there, there are multiple ways to do it, and it is extremely extensible. So um, the, if you're running in Google Cloud, for example, you could use the, um, the GCE uh, instance metadata API, which provides a, an equivalent but different document. Um, another model is if you have, say, TPMs or HSMs, you can, uh, you can, have a, you can um, lean into the TPM uh, and sign a nonce and use that to establish trust. Uh, if you have Kerberos that you've already used to establish trust, if you have met these, uh, uh, you can uh, lean on a Kerberos ticket if you like. 
uh, and then you can you can use manual join tokens if you really want to as well. So, uh, uh, but the general idea here is that the um, uh, this attestation framework is pluggable. So if you already have some way of establishing trust to the node, uh, you can write a plugin for Spire and, and make it work. Question at the back? Hi. This might be a stupid question, but um, what about using Spiffy on the client side? Let's say that I have like a factory that produces a lot of IoT devices and I want to bootstrap the IoT devices with Spiffy. Is that possible? Um, it's a good question. It's a use case that's come up a few times. Um, the uh, if you can, um, uh, the way I would frame it is to say if you can, if you have a, a way of establishing trust to the device, if you have some say embedded credential inside the device itself, um, then you can use you can write a uh, you could write an attester that could lean into that, um, and then use that to establish Spiffy IDs to your software that's running on the device. Uh, so yes, there's definitely a model there. Uh, question? How do you establish trust between the Spiffy agent and the, your code? Because the Spiffy agent is going to tell it what else to trust. Yeah, so the Spiffy, uh, in the model we showed, the Spiffy agent uh, is actually leaning on the kernel to provide trust. So in this case, the, the workload calls the Spiffy API with you know, via a Unix domain socket. Uh, the, the agent will then... Uh, use the metadata it gets from that call to go back to the kernel and say, well, okay, tell me, tell me who this is, give me its PID, UID, and so forth. Uh, it, can then, it can then lean into other things like kubelets if it needs to. What I mean is how does your app know that the spiffy agent is trustworthy? Oh, I see. It doesn't. It has, it has to trust. We assume that the, in, in this case, we have a model that assumes that the, uh, that, uh, the spiffy infrastructure itself is trustworthy. The app may not be. Oh, I see. Did I answer the question properly? Or? I think you're, you're trusting that whatever is on the socket and, and is trustworthy. Oh, I see. So, well, yes, to an extent, right? It's a, uh, it's uh, um, uh, in this case a profit. But that said, uh, it's the. Um, it, we assume at this point it's the responsibility of the infrastructure provider to maintain that. So it's the responsibility of the Spiffy implementer, basically. So hopefully the credentials you get from this fake system aren't actually usable in any meaningful way. Yeah, and, and there may be ways in the future to mitigate some of that, which mm -hmm. is part of what we'll have a discussion about when we tar start to talk about the security audit, mm -hmm. the results of it. Cool. 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 Question at the back? And how is the trust established between the agent and uh, the Spiffy server? So when it communica communicates, I mean, it probably uses TLS for that or something like that? Uh, yeah, so the, um, I think there's two parts to that. It, it is mutual TLS between the two. Okay. Uh, the, way, uh, <clears throat> the way that we establish, sorry, was your question about how the, how, the, how the agent trusts the server? Exactly. So that when the agent communicates to the Spiffy server that he knows that it is the correct server, not someone else. That's a great question. There is a, uh, there's a, there's a pre-established certificate that you can deploy that can verify it. Um, there is, I believe, a better way of doing it than just trusting the, the pre-established key that you can rotate, but I could be wrong about that. Do you want to give them the microphone? So, so yeah. when you, um, you install the agent, it'll come with its initial bundle from the server, and then that gets rotated too. Yeah. So when you install the agent, it'll come with a bundle from the server, so you don't man in the middle of it. So it just doesn't take it uh, by default. So you will have that trust, and then that gets rotated also. So those certs get, get rotated. And, and the big thing is that up and down the whole scheme, just from intermediate up to uh, and the signing cert, which would be upstream, that could all be all rotated also and deployed. So regarding the, um, the authentication between the agents and the server, 
using the AWS metadata. If you have a workload on that instance which is configured in such a way that it has unrestricted network access, what's to prevent the workload from fetching the instance metadata and pretending to be a, spiffy, uh, a Spire agent to the Spire server? Not a lot. Um, but then again, the only thing it would be able to have access to is to workload metadata, um, workload metadata from that node. Uh, so it really, if, you, if you're saying uh, what Spiffy doesn't provide is any isolation guarantees between processes running on that node. So if you have a mechanism for providing that isolation, Spiffy can work with it in order to issue identities, but it doesn't guarantee that isolation in any way. So if you trust Kubernetes to provide that isolate or, or, or you know, a container runtime to provide that isolation for you, for example, um, then Spiffy can work with it, but it won't guarantee that. Um, so if your container isolation fails, then it will fail too. Cool. All right, I think that's it for questions. Thank you so much for uh, sticking with us, guys.